Good morning. It's uh, July 17th and I'm with Charlie Killen and Brett Owsley. Yep. And uh, here's Charlie. Say hi, Charlie. Hello. Brett. Hello. Thanks. Thanks for setting this up, Brett. I really no appreciate problem. it. And and uh, Charlie and Brett are gonna are gonna uh, explain to us how the DNR manages the water levels in the Princess Point area, given the um, everything that's happened here. And let, let me, I'm just gonna pan down and look at the map here quick. Let's see, Charlie, if you can hold that up. Uh, the other, hold it up against the sun. I'm not sure how well that'll come through, but uh, we're over here on this impoundment right here. I see. Okay. Bark is coming from this direction, scuppernong from this direction. Yeah, we came we came north uh, from on Highway P. We drove south on a DNR access road, and uh, and we followed uh, an impoundment uh, uh, levee. Would you call mm -hmm. it? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Show us what, what we're looking okay. at now. Well, basically, we're looking at this impoundment like so. Okay. <laughs> that makes okay. better sense. There we go. And in the distance, you can see the edge of the trees. That's where the, the berm or the dike or the levee is. And it wraps around to the high ground way over ah, here. Way in the distance there, but past way. that dead tree. I see. Way, the, way, the, way the out. tree line way out there is That's, the western, the south, we call it the southwestern border? Yes. Okay. The southwestern edge. And it loops all the way around. You can see the edge of the trees come all the way around. And it ties back into the same hill over here by the tall trees in the distance there. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a, somewhere in the neighborhood of, actually Im, impacted by water. I think this impoundment is about 400 acres, 350 to 400 acres. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's the impact that you have with the water. What, Many years ago, uh, you're talking 50 years ago type time frame, uh, this, all, this area all got ditched out for muck farm, farming operations, agricultural operations. That was the Dean Kincaid, uh, Dean Kincaid was the one that was initiating that? Kincaid, Dean Kincaid was one of them. There, there were more, more people involved mm -hmm. you know, at that time, but mm -hmm. he, he's the one who hung on and became big. Um, and so a lot of this land that, that was wetland at the time uh, was drained for agricultural reasons. Everything that we're looking at in the foreground here? Pretty much, yes. On both sides of the river? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well, as far as we can see. And, and the river is actually passing through this area in the foreground here somewhere. We can't obviously see it because we're not high enough, but... Right. The, the, the Scuppernong is flowing just the other side of the dike out there yeah, where so, the trees are. Right, that, just that, that, 50 that, yards past it. Right, that body of water there is, an, is part of the impoundment system and Correct. there's a dike. Right, and we, we paddled our boat on the on the, on this, this north side of that dike because we we got lost trying to follow the river which is, you're saying, just 50 yards to the, uh, on the south end of that dike. Right, right, and that's where the scuppernong goes. Right. The bark is actually flowing just out of sight on this edge, on mm -hmm. the western edge, mm -hmm. and at the far southwest corner, 200 yards into the trees is where they the confluence is. Of the three uh, three water flows? Yeah, the uh, Spring Creek. Yeah. Spring Creek, Bark, and Scuppernaw. Excellent. So talk a little bit about how you actively manage the water levels and what, what prompts you to take action and how do you monitor the actions that you take? And Well, it's kind of a, what your objectives are is kind of a balance. It has been a balance between trying to mimic what the wetlands did prior to drainage and we have to be careful because we can't negatively impact a neighbor in anything we do. So we're trying to put the water, the hydrology back to where it was. Now, being a riverine system, a riparian type cover habitat, um, water level fluctuations were very active and very rapid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we also try to mimic that as much as we can, but we don't want to go so dry that our wetlands are dry every year. Uh, it's good for wetlands to dry up every once in a while so they recharge with new seed and new vegetation growth, new in insect invertebrate growth. Um, so what we do is we try to do what's what's called in a lot of states moist soil management and uh, what we do is we hold water on it like this for two, three, four years and the vegetation types change, the community, the wild communities change, the invertebrate community changes every year. There's, a, there's kind of an evolution, a, or not evolution, a, what am I? Cycle. Yes, okay, good. And uh, there's, you go through these cycles, and what happens is succession starts to take over, and you get into these more 
long-lived plants, long-lived, sometimes woody vegetation. And so then what we'll do is we'll, we'll pull the boards on the, take the control structure and open it up so let all the water out. Do you want to point, to, point that out of the map for a second, Charlie? If, if we have the map here, we can... Control structure for this impoundment. Now we're flipping it, and we, got, we want to look from the north to the south again, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so P is behind us to the north, and we're looking at the, the west the side is on our right. The impoundments, we're about here. Thanks, Brett. We're, we're right in about here, and the impoundment, the dike goes all the way around like this in a big loop, ties into up, up one. And the control structure is right here. It drains out this little mm -hmm. ditch. Yeah. So, the, so, so that's how you're able to draw water away from the scuppernog and, and bring it into the impoundment? Well, either or. Either or. I'm either sorry. Either or. Um, we can pull the boards or take the dam out, basically let the water out of the impoundment so it dries up and recharges. It grows a bunch of new vegetation and start mm -hmm. that whole process over, that whole mm -hmm. cycle. We want to charge it, start mm -hmm. it over, mm -hmm. which becomes very beneficial to mm -hmm. a, a huge host of of species and uh, the other option is when the river comes up we have boards in here that the dam is closed um, when the boat when the water comes up fast from a heavy rain and we want to put water in we can run down and pull the dam out let the water run in and, be, and as soon as it starts to turn around and run out we put the dam back in got it and hold the water so we we can manage to keep this as a wetland which it probably was a very seasonal wetland at the time when it was, you know, prior to drainage, and we try to mimic that, but yet we don't want to lose all our wetland quality or wetland. Right. Now, is is, so. is that is this the only impoundment that you're actively managing on? No. Or, or? No, we've got just across the Bar uh, Scuppernong River, other side. Okay. We have this whole area here, it actually goes off the map a ways. And here is another impoundment that we we call that the refuge impoundment. That one's closed to waterfall hunting. The rest of it is open to waterfall hunting. So we have two impoundments. We had these two impoundments that we were actively managing, but we have uh, berm problems. They need to be repaired. Muskrats have torn holes in them. So now they back when the water goes up, they back up, and they're very uh, ephemeral type wetland. Mm -hmm very seasonal type wetlands. So, which is good. I mean, that's not a bad thing. It's just not what we were, our objective was here. Mm -hmm. Brett, uh, Brett the, let me ask you, Brett, are you thinking about uh, uh, taking action to get those berms fixed so that you can begin mm -hmm. uh, proactively managing that area again? Yeah, obviously any management berm work, it's a fairly expensive uh, ordeal. So what we, the department has is that we write projects and we're you know, we write projects to justify here's what we're trying to do, and then we await a funding source. And mm -hmm. so uh, we, we've got projects in to, to repair those dikes. It's just a matter of now of when the money's available, uh, then we can start work on them. Interesting. And we've repaired, repaired the refuge berm, and then... Uh, and this one. And this berm here. So we've had... We've been actively restoring berms in this area. It's just a matter of getting the funding source and then yeah. we can uh, uh, get to work. Right. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the Go ahead, Charlie. Okay. Well, I, I did talk about the water. We can, we can trap water from, you know, obviously we get rain. Uh, we get some runoff off these, off these uplands. And we also get uh, water from the river when the river comes up and backflows into the... But one of the, the most valuable um, sources of water is this area is just full of springs and seeps. Nice. And you can see we're on top of a hill, but mm -hmm. there's cattails growing right here. Ah. So, and and you got uh, Angelica here. Mm -hmm. do, do, does the flow of the Bark River enter into your management plans at all? Is that water source also part of the water uh, input or output that that you manage here? Uh, only in that it contributes contributes a lot of water to the the whole basin. You know, creates. That together with the scupper and I see. To back things up because of all the water flowing in. And one Got of the it. major wetland factors and benefits is flood mitigation. Right. So high water comes up, this area can fill with water and then as a wetland serve its purpose of holding water, slowly letting water go, filtering it out. So, you know, it's a natural filter and that's right. one of the main benef filter. benefits of having a wetland uh, around a riverine system. Yeah. Uh, Brett, do you, or Charlie, do you have... Um, uh, dynamic water gauges that that upload data. Do you have to check 
when it, when it rains, does somebody say, hey, we better go check? And, and you, is, or do you manage it uh, with an automated system at all? No. No. No we automated just system. All just by eye. Yeah. <laughs> so if the bark is backing things up and then someone has to, you have to think about it, someone has to come out here and go, well, what should we do? Well, it right. comes with experience that, you know, Charlie's wealth of experience and then the other DNR employees that are in Jefferson County have an idea of that if we're experiencing a significant rain event, we, you know, basically everybody understands across the state that if anytime we have significant rain events, go check your water control structures, see where right. they're at, and, and, and what, address any issues. And once the manager that's in charge learns learns the impoundment, yep. you know, you know, I knew that on this one that I'd want to be, if, if I got a rain event and I wanted to trap water, I'd have to go pull the boards right away and have three days. If we didn't have more rain, three days it'd be down, I'd have to put them back in again, you know. Right. So, it was, and it seemed to work out pretty close every time. Based on your strategy, whether you're bringing water in or out. Right, right. Now, one interesting thing you'd ask about history, too, is these two impoundment dikes, the, the Hunnable and the Refuge impoundment, were built by a local farmer, uh, the original, I mentioned Paul Kennedy as the original wildlife manager here, many, many years ago before permits and all that kind of stuff existed. Um, he purchased all this land for a wildlife area and a lot of it was ag land, farmable land. And so what he did was he, he worked a deal with the local farmer who had a drag line, said, you can farm our land for X number of feet of dike every year. And that's how he did it. He let the farmer go in there. So when the farmer wasn't working his land, he was on our land, conservation department land, building a dike out there through the marsh. With the, with a tool called the drag line? A dra yeah, it was... Uh, Soil moving tool? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, the big bucket they, they swing out and you get some mud. And, oh, okay. Yeah, some, a lot of people call them a dredge. So. Got it, got it. And um, and that was something that Char uh, that uh, Paul Kennedy told you about. Yeah, yeah, he mm -hmm. told me about that. That he a lot of times he, mm -hmm. he this area is so soft and so wet mm -hmm. that a lot of times he'd see the machine out there in the water with the fan on the engine whopping the water into the air, you know, while wow. he was working, and he he just Amazing. shook his head wondering how the guy's ever going to get the machine out, but he always did. So. Well, you know, I talked to Gary Kincaid on the phone the other day, and he, he mentioned that he, he thought his father, Dean, had put that the, the ditch in just west of 106, where the Scarpenau goes under 106. Probably did. He put, he put that big stretch in, and then you're saying that on the west end here, a different farmer was 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 involved with uh, putting in uh, water control structures. Right, and he was doing it for the exact opposite reason. Kincaid was doing it to drain it so he could farm more, and the farmer that Kennedy had doing it was putting in dikes and dike systems and control structures to hold water so it wouldn't be farmed. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a forward-thinking person, and so I see. So, well, why didn't why didn't he just leave it alone? Why didn't why did why did he feel the need to put dikes in it all? If he just wanted it to, to to be a wetland, it was a wetland when he got there. No, it wasn't. It was drained. Oh, because it already had been through a cycle of agricultural activity. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So it was put back as a wet one. I got it. Yeah. Okay. And so what you're seeing is is the management, you know, of the purchase of the wildlife area, the use of impoundments like Charlie had just described, is the as managing a, an altered system. Yes. You know, there's, you know, a mention of what you expected a pure natural setting. Uh, and right now, you know, that's what we're working to create what well, I think some would call a simulated natural setting because, you know, from a water, holding water, letting water go, we don't have the, we don't own enough land to where you can affect everything on a basin, so to speak. So we've created this pocket here, the Princess Point Wildlife Area, to mimic a natural management cycle, knowing that it's not management, you know, not natural because you do have impoundments and berms and water control structures, but the main goal of those are to mimic a national, a natural water regime that you would see you know mm -hmm. pre-settlement very interesting wow uh, any any closing thoughts here on on uh, brett are you, you're about a year or two on the job now or yep. what, what do you like the best about working out here doing this being out on the <laughs> area interacting with our constituents you know yeah. i think I'm, you know, what do you call me don't you call me a constituent <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're part of our user groups that we have on our wildlife areas and uh you know 
Yeah. It's something that we enjoy interacting with the public on. And, and then you've got the management and you're trying to get the money to, to rebuild the structures and mm -hmm. then there's an active watching the water, yep. watching the rain. And and uh, what about the uh, the flora and fauna? Do you, is, that, is that another area, someone else's, you're the property manager here, but do you delegate flora and fauna management to other well, the DNR property, people? Uh, we, d we have a science operations uh, folks that work on uh, specific projects, but the property manager uh, which is currently vacant is the Jefferson County biologist, which was Charlie's position. Uh, oh, so you're he, not the property manager. I'm not the property manager. Oh. I'm the wildlife supervisor. So oh. I supervise the property managers in Dodge and Jefferson County. And so his, Charlie's position recently retired is vacant and we're currently uh, going through a recruitment process and we'll have a new biologist for the Jefferson County area and as property manager, Princess Point. But they are the main, uh, the wildlife biologist, the Jefferson County Wildlife Technician and our LTE are basically our temporary employee. They are the main eyes and ears on, in Jefferson County for doing survey work, uh, recording any fl uh, local flora and fauna, any endangered mm -hmm. species. They're the they're the main uh, eyes on the property that do that work as well. Do you have uh, any active program?